So now let's have a look at some of the uh, special kinds of terms that are in contracts, exclusion clauses or disclaimers. So you've probably all come across an exclusion clause or a disclaimer. They're very common in contracts. In these cases, one of the parties is going to say, look, we're not going to be held responsible even if we breach uh, part of our contractual obligations. So they're trying to limit or exclude liabilities uh, for lots of co different kinds of events. Um, you can see examples of these kinds of clauses as we've got written here, no refunds, passengers ride at their own risk, no responsibility taken for lost goods and so on. There's a whole uh, series of, of ways that these are written to try and exempt the contracting party from liability. Now this is a complex area of law. Um, it's highly regulated and we're going to concentrate a bit more on the common law or the contracting side of it but you need to remember that there's lots of statute law around this and what you can and can't uh, disclaim liability for. So what we have is a party who's in breach of say a contract or a law and they're trying to rely on this exclusion clause to get out of trouble. Whether or not they'll be able to rely on a disclaimer um, requires two key questions to be answered. Is the disclaimer a term of the contract? And then second is how will that disclaimer be interpreted when you're applying it to the particular facts around the breach in question? So it's a two-step process. Is the disclaimer a term of the contract? The second, does it apply and or how will it be applied? Okay, first step, is it a term of the contract? It will be a term of the contract if it's included in a signed written document, so like those express terms we dealt with, or it was brought to the other party's attention by reasonable notice, uh, like we looked at earlier before, or it can be implied as a result of prior dealings. And you can go back to the case of Balmain, New Ferry and Robertson that we went through earlier in this particular section. One of the things you have to be a little bit careful of is that the full extent of the disclaimer is given to the other party to the contract. So if you only partially outline what the impact of the disclaimer is, it may indicate that the, that the disclaimer has been misrepresented and therefore it won't become a term of the contract. Curtis and Chemical Cleaning and Dyeing Company is an example of that. And you can see how this situation occurred where Curtis takes in their wedding dress to have it dry cleaned. Uh, this often happens when people are going to get it sealed up so they can keep it uh, for their family um, later on down the line. And so Curtis takes the dress in to be dry cleaned. The shop assistant hands over a document that's headed receipt. And we know earlier that that might have an issue around reasonable notice if you only think it's a receipt rather than um, a contract holding terms uh, of your agreement. But in this case, the shop assistant kind of has been schooled about this and explains that the receipt is not just a receipt. It also forms part of the contract and it exempts CCD for any damage to the beads and the sequins. Now the term didn't actually say that. The term actually said that they were exempted from liability for any damage howsoever arising. And CCD damages the dress, but not the beads or sequins, they damage the actual dress. And they, CCD then tries to rely on this disclaimer. In this instance, the court finds that the assistant had misrepresented the effect of the disclaimer by specifying uh, it was about the beads and the sequins rather than any damage whatsoever, it meant that this exclusion clause couldn't be relied on, the disclaimer couldn't be relied on because it had been misrepresented. So that reasonable notice about the disclaimer needs to be clear. We've already been through Balmain, New Ferry and Robertson, I won't go through it again, um, but the key point for us is the final a sentence here that someone who's contracting with another party several times can be deemed to be aware of the terms of that contract if it would be reasonable to be so, even if a person who was contracting for the first time wouldn't be aware.
So hopefully we now understand that to have a disclaimer in place, it must either be signed in writing and then signed as part of the agreement, or reasonable notice must have been given. That reasonable notice must not be misrepresented, or it could be um, implied by the prior dealings uh, of the parties. So just say we've got it as a term, then we need to know is will it apply to these specific circumstances? Probably the most important concept here is how the courts interpret a disclaimer. And they interpret with another beautiful Latin phrase, contra proferentum. So what all that means is that when they're reading the term, they read it narrowly and they interpret it, if there's any ambiguity, they interpret it against the interests of the party who is seeking to rely upon it. So the case of White and John Warwick and Company is uh, an, an example of this. They had a particular uh, clause in their terms of contract which said, nothing in this agreement shall render the owners liable for any personal injuries to the riders of the machines hired. So they were a bike hire company. White hires a bike from them, gets injured when there's a problem with the saddle. It turns out that John Warwick and Co weren't maintaining the bikes correctly. They were actually negligent in how they maintained the bikes and that caused the saddle problem. When the court looks at this, it's, it's got an issue, right? Because it's saying, well, they're not responsible for any personal injuries to the riders of the machines. But on the other hand, this injury was a direct result of the negligence of John Warwick rather than an issue about the rider having an accident, etc., on their own. So was this term meant to encompass everything, including the negligence of John Warwick? Or was it only meant to cover those things, such as uh, accidents and stuff that was beyond the control of John Warwick and company? Now, under our contra proferentum rule, we know that we need to read it down. And reading this clause down actually says that they are liable for their negligence and that this disclaimer was only for things beyond the control of John Warwick and company. So that's an important rule that these disclaimers will be read down if there's any ambiguity. In a similar way, disclaimers only cover those situations which are within the four corners or the normal operation of the contract. Sydney Corporation and West is a case that gives us an example of that. So in this case, we have a, a car park and West parks the car and he gets issued with a ticket. The ticket has a disclaimer on it like you'll probably find when you go to a car park. And it says the council who, who actually owns the car park doesn't accept any responsibility for loss or damage to the vehicle, howsoever such loss may arise or be caused. caused. Now the ticket also said that you had to present the ticket for time stamping and paying uh, before you could leave with your car. Now it just so happens that West's car was stolen and that as part of the theft, the attendant had allowed the thief to impersonate West and actually leave without presenting the ticket. So that the thief had said that they've lost the ticket and the attendant let them go. So what did the court, court actually say here? Now what they're saying is that Sydney Corporation was really partially responsible, right? Because they let the imposter go. And by allowing the thief to take the car, the council had acted completely outside the normal operation of the contract. Because normally you had to give the ticket in. And by Sydney Corporation actually allowing the car to go without getting the ticket, they have acted outside the four corners of the contract, its normal operation, and the exclusion clause can't be construed to cover that kind of situation where they haven't held up an essential part of their bargain, which was to actually ask for the ticket, particularly when that causes the loss involved. Okay, exclusion clauses. Remember, we need to make sure that the exclusion clause or disclaimer is actually a term, it can be that expressly signed and written and part of the deal, um, or being given reasonable notice. Remember, if we're giving reasonable notice, that it must um, properly represent the disclaimer and not misrepresent the disclaimer.
um, whether it's a term can also be implied uh, by the prior conduct of the parties in terms of contracting. Then when it's going to apply, remember that generally um, it will be read down and it will be limited if there's any ambiguity around the disclaimer and its meaning. It will also only operate within the normal operations of the contract or the four corners of the contract. Finally, as I said right at the beginning um, of this particular little section, disclaimer clauses are highly regulated as part of consumer law, which we're going to look at in week 10.